Welcome, everybody. Uh, I know it's a tight squeeze in here, so let me ask a favor right off the bat. If there's an empty seat next to you, especially on these little edges, scoot down. I know it's going to be painful on you, but it's better for our audience when they come in and they're not tripping all over you. So we appreciate it. We know everybody take a big breath in and out because you're, <laughs> you're tight there. <laughs> We're going to talk a lot about health and fitness, and so you're, you're going to feel healthy whether, whether you feel it right now or not. Thank it's like you. that announcement on Southwest yes. Airlines. That's right. I know. You might as well look up and give up that middle seat. That's right. That's right. We want you all to be friends because we're talking morning. about a, a really important topic called health citizenship. Uh, this is an area that Faster Cures has been looking at really since our founding. Uh, but it, this concept of health citizenship came up very loud and clear in a series of interviews that we did. So I know I have a couple slides in the deck. If you can pull up slide number two for me. Um, we did a series of interviews prior to the presidential election last summer, and we talked to over 150 different senior stakeholders in the biomedical research and healthcare ecosystem. And we asked them, if you, you know, had the ear of the president and the next administration, what would you have them think about? What would you have them do? So you can find this report on our website, fastercures.org. This is the series of seven different recommendations that came up. And they, they run the gamut from um, the regulatory system, patient centricity, looking at translational research, clinical trials, data, access. But one theme that we kept hearing about, and if you could go to slide number three, was a theme that was cross-cutting. And it was defined by one of our um, interviewees as something that they called health citizenship. What is health citizenship? Well, according to the way that people were discussing it, they felt that we had finally reached this point in our healthcare delivery system and in the, the research paradigm where you could have a two-way dialogue from the consumer slash patient, which many of our panelists are gonna tell their perspectives on today, to either the healthcare system or the research system. And this is something new because the system hasn't always worked this way. The system often has been uh, really one directional from the researcher to the, the research subject or the healthcare system or the physician to the patient. Basically, uh, and I, I would, you know, if you're thinking visually, uh, that system is down on, or they're up on high and the patient is way down below, kind of looking up, usually a little scared, maybe not saying anything. So we really feel at Faster Cures that the time has come for this two-way dialogue. And we've put together an extremely exciting and dynamic group of speakers uh, to tell you a little bit about the world according to them and the perspectives that they're bringing from all their different vantage points. So I asked them to get ready for um, some different ways of doing the panel. The, the first order of business is they're gonna give you a fun fact about themselves. So rather than me do the work, they're gonna do the work. So Ronnie, you go first. Name, rank, and serial, serial number. So your name, what organization, and, and something fun about you. So you were serious about that? Absolutely. <laughs> they, see, <laughs> keep them guessing. All right, I'm Ronnie Zeiger. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Smart Patients. Um, I'll give you a fact. It's not fun, but it's very inspiring for me. Um, at 5.15 on August 1st, 2011, I had a uh, brain bleed, and that caused me to leave my job at Google and start Smart Patients. So it's a fact. That's not fun. It's kind of fun uh, in some ways. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Bernard. Wow. Um. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I literally sorry, sprung man. this on him in the hallway, and he, you know, people are like, "Hello, hello. Can I talk about my Kaiser?" So um, I'm Bernard Tyson, Chairman and CEO of Kaiser Permanente. I guess a fun fact. I don't know if it's fun though. Um, even though I uh, run as a chairman and CEO, I think one of the most incredible healthcare organization. My, um, my dream has always been to be a physician, a doctor. And the fact is, in 2019, Kaiser Permanente is opening up his first medical school right here in Pasadena, California. The sad commentary is I've been hinting that maybe I could go back to medical school and so far, I haven't been accepted. <laughs> <laughs> I think there may be a conflict of interest there. 
All right, I'm going to skip myself. But what? Go oh, ahead, Joyce. No, I got to think a little bit unfair. more. <laughs> Moderator um, prerogative. Okay. Uh, so I'm Joyce Tung. I'm vice president of research at 23andMe, and now I really don't know what to do for my fact. Um, so I will say, since we don't, we're not requiring it to be fun. Uh, when I graduated from college and applied to graduate school, the sort of my scholarship application, you know, we have to propose a, a sort of a study or a field of research that we wanted to do. And at the time, what I really wanted to do was treat disease using sort of the disease's underlying genetics to sort of understand how we could personalize treatment for each individual. And I thought, gosh, wouldn't it be great if someday I could work doing that? And then lo and behold, I start my postdoc and somebody starts this company that uses genetics to inform people about their personal risk for things. And I was like, this is great. And <laughs> that's where we are today. Excellent. Stephanie. Yeah, and Stephanie Deviani. I'm the deputy director of the All of Us Research Program at the National Institutes of Health. Um, my fun fact is very trivial, but uh, it's fun. I, ever, I cannot walk up or downstairs without counting them. I cannot do it. Oh. And uh, at my previous job, we had sort of these like long winding stairwells, and I had a couple colleagues who would intentionally try to engage me in conversation as we we're walking up and down them to prevent me from counting them. Ah, yeah. okay, cruel. It's a good segue. I have a device for you, actually. Yeah, <laughs> all right. Yeah. So, so, uh, so I have to count them myself. That'd be so good. So my name is Eric Friedman. I'm CTO and co-founder of Fitbit. So we make things that count steps. Um, <laughs> just, just see what I did. Uh, and heart rate too. We can count a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, so uh, I was going to do a different fun fact, but in light of that, uh, so um, my largest step day is uh, 94,000 steps, uh, which was very, very tiring. Um, so yeah, 40 mile walk, um, and met my wife at the end of that. So it was uh, a very worthwhile walk. All right. Uh, very nice. All right, I'm going to do the out of the box fun fact, which is I love to dance. Stephanie has come to some of my dance parties, so if anybody likes to dance, next one you can you can join us in DC. I like to get a DJ. I I pick the playlist, and I can't talk to anybody during the party because I'm out there dancing the whole time. So anyway, that's my fun fact. I don't know if uh, Fitbit counts dance steps or not. Um, all right, so let's talk about the nexus of data, technology, and research. I want to start with an opening question around. You know, the theory that I was bringing up of health citizenship, that we're finally there. So Bernard, how have you seen that evolve at Kaiser, where I think Kaiser is a system that really has put the patient uh, in more of the driver's seat? You, you bring an accountability not only to your healthcare providers, but to the patient. So how have you seen that evolve? Do you feel like we're at this kind of moment in time to really harness it now? Uh, definitely. I, I think... Um from Kaiser Permanente's standpoint, a couple of things. One, um, I think we inside the organization have finally sort of figured out what's the next evolution of health and healthcare. And it's, for me, it's really based on something that was told to me some time ago about uh, a person's life. Uh, about 40% of their health is determined by behavior. 30% uh, is determined by genetics. 20% is, uh, is directly related to where a person lives. And inside of Casa Permanente, we call that place. And then 10% is based on what we do everyday healthcare. We are motivated and incented to look at the whole person and try to keep the person as healthy as possible. So we have determined that there's no constraints that should keep us only in the medical care lane when in fact we can impact a person's health more if we, for example, work with them on exercise and work with them on stress reduction and work with them on sleep and work in the communities to make sure that the infrastructure in those communities are one in which we'll be inviting to a person's health. So on my leadership team, I just hired a new executive and his role, he's a chief community health officer. And his job is to, on my senior team, is to keep me and the team informed on what's going on for the 65 million people in the communities in which we're privileged to take care of 12 million. And so that's about looking at the totality of it and the infrastructure. 
I think the second thing is now with our use of technology in which we're putting it more and more in the hands of our members, they are responding and in fact, in many cases, behaving like consumers. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, last year, uh, over half of our encounters, those are primary care visits, et cetera, 52% of those encounters last year, roughly 100 million in total, were done virtually. That's the telephone, that's secure messaging, that's video conferencing, et cetera. So the member is getting more information and the member can go on to kp.org, pull up information, learn more about himself, herself, can go into our medical library now, look up stuff. Really, the point is to get them more engaged in the health and their well-being, more upstream as opposed to episodic care. When I gave you an example, I'm a, a covered member in Kaiser, and I gave you an example of when I entered the system, uh, having, I had medical records that would have been helpful to Kaiser to save Kaiser money and save me you know, time and, and uh, you know, sort of having to repeat medical tests. Um, and I, I express to you that it really does feel like your people are trained to sort of bring the patient into the fold. And I think that that's one of the themes that we're going to be talking about is how do we engage the patient where they are? So do you do specific training depending on the healthcare provider to, to teach some of that? Oh yes, uh, we do training, we use technology. So there's reminders in the system. Uh, when we have a new member, we have a way of tracking that new member. We work up new members uh, into Kaiser Permanente. So if you join Kaiser Permanente, we get you in. We find out what kind of prescriptions you've been taking. We do a physical on you. We do questionnaires. We work you up. And mm -hmm. then from there, we go into the mode of what do we need to do to help to keep you healthy. And we engage you, as you probably know, uh, very directly. Very yeah. vigorously. Yes. I mean, yes. but in a way that you appreciate. And I think that that's something I want the audience to be thinking about as we think about the healthcare system of the future is how do we meet the customer where they are, essentially. So, Ronnie, you know, tell us about the, the platform that you've been building and how you have created an opportunity for patients and consumers to find one another. So, and I just made me want to answer in a slightly different way, which is that dimension of place. Um, we think of place as, as kind of a point, maybe a point with a radius. Um, but really, uh, we're all networked. Um, and I don't mean in terms of our smartphones and our, and our other devices. Um, I mean the, the human networks. Um, you know, I have a previous relationship with Patrick. Maybe we shouldn't talk about it here. It's, it didn't go so well. Um, but you know, some of us will probably meet each other today. Um, as we are traversing our lives, and that includes our health, um, we have connections to others and we have needs that um, others can help us with. Um, so for example, thought experiment, um, or hypothesis rather, 10 years from now, um, I wouldn't be surprised if part of informed consent for a procedure was talking to someone who's had it before. Now that's common sense. Those of us with means and, and various kinds of resources would probably almost always do that. But actually most patients don't get to. Um, most patients are, uh, feel like many aspects of their journey, they're doing it alone. And um, there's good data actually just coming out of Kaiser Permanente, um, uh, published in the, the journal Cancer this, this year, that um, the degree of social connectedness of a woman um, uh, was predictive of her um, breast cancer recurrence, breast cancer um, specific mortality, and all-cause mortality, um, completely independent of, of, of everything else. Um, we don't totally understand why. That's a very important follow-up question. Um, so uh, my work, uh, uh, Smart Patients, it's actually really simple. It's, it's half software engineering, which is just building a really good platform fit to purpose, and half social engineering, which is figuring things out like, how soon does a person need to get a reply to make sure they feel like they feel welcomed and, and aren't left hanging? What kind of person is best suited to support a person who was just diagnosed or is sitting in a waiting room nervous about that CT scan, et cetera, et cetera? And so these are the kinds of things that um, I'm trained as a clinician. I still do a little bit of, of clinical work. I have a 
molecular biology background way back when, and all these things that I used to think were all of the answers are just the 10 percent, you know, maybe 50 percent, let's be crazy generous, but the rest is this social milieu in which we all find ourselves, and we're really not very, we're just at the beginning of designing that, and to me the biggest untapped resource for me as a patient is all the other patients out there. Um, and the last thing I'll say real quick, um, uh, I've been, how many clinicians in the room? Not, not, not enough to do my, my poll. Um, so when I'm, when I'm in front of a larger clinician audience, I'll ask, um, how many of you have in, ever <coughs> introduced one of your patients to another one of your patients? And I'll tell you that the national average through my non-random N circa 10,000 is like a third of a percent. And it's not because we thought about it and decided it's a bad idea. It's just not, it's, we, don't, we don't think that way yet. We still think um, system, patient, one to one, right. um, and that's critical and not sufficient. So Stephanie, y you are working on the All of Us um, cohort study, I don't, I don't know the official name, but it, it was born out of the Precision Medicine Initiative, uh, which came about in President Obama's administration, and you've been building basically, you know, the, the mechanics of doing an incredibly large um, cohort of people to look at, you know, kind of over time, look at a lot of different health uh, indications. So tell us a little bit about how what you've just heard relates to how you're building that and what can we expect from it? Sure. So, and, and you know, one of the things that we're hoping to do, and we have not begun enrolling people yet, but are hoping to very shortly to begin uh, enrolling, we've been working really hard with 60 or more partners across the country. Um, to build the infrastructure in order to be able to support this. Um, but ultimately, trying to collect what uh, Bernard mentioned, all of the different factors in a person's life that makes up them that could potentially affect their health over time, and to track that longitudinally uh, so that uh, researchers have a resource in which they can ask you know, really um, uh, vexing health questions, not only about you know, how disease uh, forms or progresses, but also how we stay healthy. Um, I think you know one of our hypotheses, and, and it has been proven by others, is that if we can engage people in different ways, then we can keep them coming back and providing more and more data to the to the platform over time. Um, at least that's our hope. And I think you know for us, it's also sort of a grand experiment to figure out what communities engage. You know, we'll, we'll need different types of engagement um, because we uh, one of our goals is to really bring in a diverse population, start to represent different you know actions of the country. So how so, will this be different than, for example, the Framingham study, which some in the audience yeah. may know what that was? Yeah, it's, it's funny you mention that because we've actually um, spoken with folks from the Framingham study and, and have used that as one of our inspirational you know, landmark studies because they had great engagement. I mean, they have yeah. three generations of folks who keep coming back for um, uh, for data collection and for, uh, but they, you know, they're working in, in one city. They've expanded now to other parts of the country. So we were actually talking with them about how do we take that model and scale it up. And certainly technology is on our side now. And when Framingham started, there was no way of, of engaging people through a smartphone at the simultaneously at the same time. Um, and we have that advantage now. So I think that for us will be, we will get to, we will get to figure out what types of engagement can be done over technology and what types you actually have to interact with people face to face, right? Mm -hmm. So Joyce and Eric, speaking of technology, you each represent, uh, you know, in a way, different ends of the spectrum of technology as it relates to science, to understanding, um, you know, kind of a person's, um, you know, individual genome in, in one respect, but also a person's health habits. So talk a little bit about that, Joyce. Let's start with you from the 23andMe perspective of how have you all as a company, you know, decided to engage with the individual patient and, and with communities for that matter? Sure. So, I mean, our mission is to help people access, understand, and benefit from the human genome. And I think for us, what we really want to do is be able to empower individuals with information from their own DNA, <coughs> right? So part of that is, you know, actually <coughs> allowing people to get access to that information that we all carry around in our bodies, but, you know, is not incredibly easily accessed otherwise. But I think a big aspect for us is to really make the genetics and the science really easy to understand and to and to make people feel smart like 
I can understand this, I can use that information. And so to that end, a huge amount of what we do is really trying to make things understandable so that people can really engage with it and to have it be a little bit more of a dialogue so customers can, you know, over time get more reports on their own DNA as new findings are made. We also have a research program and you know, um, one of the studies that was done by David Kaufman for the Precision uh, mm -hmm. Medicine Initiative, you know, asked people like, what would you, what would be a great incentive for you in order to participate in a large study? And it was getting back information about their own health, right? So I think what gets people to come back is this curiosity about their own health and this desire to learn more so that they can make decisions, better informed decisions about how they want to live their lives. So, Eric, that whole idea of wanting to know more about one's health, I mean, you, you helped to create a, uh, a walking movement, and how have you been evolving that model? I mean, how has it changed as, as Fitbit has sort of grown as a company? Uh, you and I had talked before about ways that you aggregate that data. So tell us a little bit about that. So, yeah, it's, no, it's been a really interesting journey as we've gone from effectively sort of almost a pedometer all the way up through collecting more and more biometric information and the transformation of you know, collecting and displaying data, which actually is really valuable. Just like the number of times we get people writing into us pretty much almost on a daily basis of, hey, I saw my heart rate change dramatically due to you know, Fitbit's pure pulse, and I realized something was different than usual, and I went to see a doctor, and the doctor said, get to the emergency room right now and save someone's life. And that's kind of incredible, but that's purely based on the, just the, the looking at timelines. So I think the really interesting thing for us at the moment is how do we start taking that data and make it more actionable? Um, now, in the early days of Fitbit, it was very much about um, the community, going back to what Bernard was talking about. Um, just little things. We find that um, people who have a friend on Fitbit, or if you see people without friends and then add the friend, it adds about 700 additional steps to their step count which doesn't sound like very much, but it's about two and a half miles a week, which really starts adding up when you look at the average amount of activity and motion that someone goes through. Um, and so, you know, seeing through like, what are the various motivators that kind of change people's um, behavior? And then, then moving further on with the more kind of clinical aspects. So for example, we are working with uh, UCSF on a study about, so there's unfortunately a long queue of people who need a liver transplant. Um, and a lot of them never make it off that queue, uh, just because morbidity comes before the liver does. And so one of the things we're really excited about is how through um, being always present with you and by getting various data, whether it be you know, steps, activity, you know, recognized dancing, um, whether heart rate, all these things, how do we then use that information to build plans for them that kind of allow for better treatment of the human body while they're waiting for that liver to come and actually seeing real results. Um, and that, that to me is one of the things that's really exciting of whether it be you know, reductions in A1C for people who have Fitbits versus not and other types of things where it starts becoming a lot more clinical. And then how do we, how do we have the opportunity to have so, like you know, people go to the doctor once a year. How do we make sure data and coaching and you know, that little person reminding you that you should move more or do something healthier is with you there for the other 364 days. Uh, that's really powerful for us. So Bernard, when we had a panel prep call, one of the issues you wanted to make sure that we talked about is something that we've started to touch on a little bit, which is disparities in health in various different communities. And um, Stephanie, I know that that's part of the all of us work mm -hmm. is really understanding how do you get this broad, diverse cohort yeah. of people engaged. So how do we ensure that this two-way street that I talked about for health citizenship actually is a two-way street and that they're, we're not just leaving people behind and we're not, um, you know, they don't have to have a certain amount of discretionary income or interest or savvy to engage in some of the things we're discussing. Well, I mean, part of it is um, once you collect good data and can aggregate the data, um, and we demonstrate that at, in Kaiser Permanente because we have the individual data and then we can aggregate it up to the population. And then we also have uh, race-based data that our members voluntarily tell us about. And that gives us a chance to start to better understand the uniqueness in our different populations that we take care of. 
what it has done within Kaiser Permanente, you know, we used to spend a lot of time talking about this thing about equality, equality, equality. And that for us turned out to be just a baseline. Now, based on our understanding and the way that we are working and our physicians within the Permanente Medical Group is now using the data and the information, I would say that we have now redefined the narrative actually away from equality, and equality is a given, to equity. And equity says, no, I need to give what's needed mm -hmm. to raise the bar in these particular areas. And so as a concrete example, um, in Mid-Atlantic, we did this massive initiative to get the African-American African population for high blood pressure uh, down to the majority population. And uh, the group from Mid-Atlantic, the physician leader, the president, and everyone just presented to our, board on last, to our board last year because they, in fact, met the goal. When we started to drill down on how they did it, they had different methods to go to the community. They went to different vehicles for access points. And so they went into the barbershop and to the beauty shop. They went to the churches. They created more uh, community engagement and involvement um, because the one-on-one -on -one doctor office visit didn't produce the outcome by itself that we needed. Right. And so, yes, we added more resources to concentrate into these areas. We have mobile vans all over the country, and so we put some of those mobile vans right there in the community. Mm -hmm. And so we created different access points that's based on this theory of equity to figure it out as opposed to equality, which is everybody has an opportunity to go to the doctor's office visit. And so part of this is us better understanding how to take this massive data and really figure out so the so what, what are we gonna do about it? And then the second thing is with the cell phone in which many people across multiple economics and everything have it, the more we can send out in the form of that technology um, we think is another avenue to dealing with the whole issue of disparities of care and being able to reach out into the population as opposed to being defined as when they come in right. for care. Others want to comment on that? So I think equality is really interesting. Um, and in some ways what's interesting about equality is how, how does that dovetail with individuality? Because I think that so much of treatment is about um, recognizing that different people react to different um, conditions and different treatments um, in a very unique way. Um, so whether it be through personalized medicine, through the, ge um, you know, the genome, um, to you know, the way different people react to different advice and different feedback or uh, react to different diseases, for example. Um, so the idea that you can, as you start having large populations of um, users or populations of um, care recipients, you want to recognize that, hey, this person, when we tell them to do X, they react this way, versus when we tell this other person to do the same thing, they react in a very different way. And being able to customize the messaging or the behavioral patterns to that person, ideally with you know, predisposed information from you know, your genome, but then also looking at you know, all those different cultural things that add up to then how do we react. Um, and I find that really interesting. But do we think that the systems are actually talking the way that we're talking on this panel? Um, you know, are they being as thoughtful about these issues of meeting kind of the customer where they are? I mean, you know, Stephanie, how, how do you guys see that playing out with the precision medicine work? It seems a bit like an experiment that, yeah. you know, we'll have to see how it goes, right? Not just the cohort I'm talking about, but, but this Ultimately. notion. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, I, you know, I think... I think so much of our health is is directly rel related to our behavior and our lifestyle, and behavior is really hard to change. I, I mean, I can't stop counting steps. <laughs> uh, so I think you know, I, I'm I'm also sort of intrigued by this notion, uh, not to dodge your question because I can come back to it, but this notion that um, that Ronnie brought up about social networks, and and you know, it's sort of come up across the the, the panel and in, in even the competitiveness of friends who are on Fitbit together. Um, I'm wondering how much that plays into people taking, you know, sort of ownership over their own health. Or like if you guys at 23andMe see people coming together and, and communicating in social groups on their findings and, and if that's translated into anything. Well, Joyce, talk Certainly about something. the Parkinson's work that you guys have done. Because I remember early on when you were collecting, you know, people who had Parkinson's had impacted their lives. Um, that there were spit tests or spit, 
you know, sort of mm -hmm. gatherings where they would, you know, gather their samples yeah. together and send them off. And I mean, are you seeing people who aggregate into 23andMe because they have a certain interest? Well, you know, so we have a number of different sort of research studies that we actually go out into the community and recruit for. And I think, you know, one thing that was really um, interesting to me in the early days when we were recruiting people for the Parkinson study, so we, we went to a conference where there was a, it was a Parkinson advocacy, Parkinson advocacy group, and we were recruiting people for the study there. Um, and I, and I was just, I was amazed at just sort of the enthusiasm for participating in this study. You know, I think a lot of people feel like, oh, you know, it's hard to recruit for clinical trials. You know, people don't really want to participate in research. And that's just not been our experience at all. And I, I don't think that you guys are going to have much trouble either because I think, in fact, people, you know, we were trying to figure out, like, what is it that gets people to participate? And there is a huge sense of altruism, mm -hmm. a, a real desire to, you know, to help each other so that, you, you know, others don't suffer for themselves, to help their families, right? And I think, um, I do think that that feeling of being part of a larger thing is empowering yeah. as well. Sometimes, you know, you, you know, you get this diagnosis and there's this thing, it's like, how did this happen to me? I, you know, why do I not have any control? But getting involved in research and feeling like you're doing something as part of a larger effort, I think is really meaningful to people. Well, and I don't think that we've tapped into that nearly enough. I think that, yeah. you know, there's a long way to go. And so perhaps with uh, the All of Us work and, and other things that we've been talking about. So I want to dive into kind of the, the alternate of this, which is the see me underbelly of gathering all this data on people. Uh, if I put on my, you know, conspiracy theory hat, I would say, well, why do, why do they need all that information? How do I know that something isn't going to happen with it? Um, maybe there's going to be some sort of a data breach. So how are all of you thinking about that? I think Kaiser is, you know, I don't, I don't know if I signed off on something when I became a patient, but I predict I did that said, Margaret, your data is going into a massive cohort that's going to be recycled constantly for both the greater good in terms of scientific papers, but also care delivery at Kaiser. Um, and I, you know, I'm sure all of your different, you know, models. You have to click some button and say, "Oh, sure, I give you permission for this." But, but where is the community on this notion? And are we talking enough to the consumers and patients about what they think it should look like? So. I think actually the previous topic and this one are intimately related. And, and the reason is that we have today um, somewhat of a, a false dichotomy between um, things like research, which have to do with getting access to your data and um, an aggregation and science and the related privacy concerns. And then we have this thing that we pretend is totally separate which is uh, care delivery, um, having a conversation with you, understanding what your particular needs are, um, understanding the degree to which we have to go to your community with a different tactic, whether it's a van or a text message or whatever it is. And, and I think you, know, you were asking earlier in, our dis in our, one of our prep discussions is you know, sometimes people dismiss Kaiser's success as, well, that's just Kaiser. You know, there's some secret sauce that Bernard nev is never going to tell us about. <laughs> um, and, and I think part of that secret sauce is that it is becoming more harmonized. And we're talking about figuring problems out with patients and for patients and breaking down that barrier. And when you present someone, whether it's with a Fitbit or 23andMe or the opportunity to participate in a different study or terrific, a terrific care experience, um, if you present someone with concrete value as a context for them to consider the issues around privacy and or other risks, then that can be a meaningful discussion. And people are voting with their behavior by saying, that's OK. Now, if you have an abstract discussion that tells people, you know, how many of you would be comfortable giving away your social security number to uh, a company who wants to do x, y, z? You know, 0% will say yes. But their behavior suggests differently because that's usually framed in a different context. Yeah. Others? Oh. I was I was say say Eric and then Bernard. I was going to say it's actually a really good point. I think that the making sure that the information is not buried in kind of a random click-through, like it's actually really upfront, like, hey, we are soliciting your input to help this, 
um, or this, this forward advancement in science or this kind of study. Um, it's amazing how many people will volunteer and agree to that. Um, and so one of the things that's really important is just the transparency of here's what you're doing and here's why we're doing it. And as long as people don't feel surprised, like, you know, if people are surprised, bad things happen, like even if it's the best of intents. Um, and so the trick is really making sure we don't surprise, you know, our users, our customers, our patients, and saying, here's what we're going to do with it. Yeah. Bernard? Yeah, I was, I was going to say um, something very similar. A couple of quick thoughts on this. One is, um, I, I would say the most important asset that we have with our 12 million members is this thing called trust, uh, in particular with the physician and the patient, uh, and then secondarily with the organization itself. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, our members understand that we do believe strongly that the healthcare industry needs to be completely transformed and that the healthcare industry with all due respect was designed to take care of people when they were sick in an episodic way. And we just don't think that that is the right way to go, especially in the 21st century. And so we work hard on this thing called maximizing a person's healthy life years. And so in our interaction with our members, it is centered around we're trying to work with you to keep you as healthy as possible, no matter what condition that you're in. And so the research falls under that umbrella and the proactive communications and getting you in for the regular visits and the things that we have to do in episodic care. It's really geared off of that philosophy. Uh, um, our members are very clear about their concern, about the confidentiality of their information, and so we're very sensitive to how we use it, how we maintain transparency with the members, what's going on, and letting members opt in as opposed to an opt-out strategy, right? right? And so, um, and that is one of the biggest concerns because our members, as you know, know that we have all of this on the electronic health record Etc. And so, cybersecurity and everything is a major concern that we're very um, sensitive to. We have an awesome panel. When is it, Kim? On Wednesday. Wednesday morning. On cybersecurity and health. So there's there's another panel for you guys to check out on that. I want to hear Joyce from you. How do you all view that trust relationship and the the privacy and the security of the data? Pretty paramount with what you do. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was been nodding sort of very enthusiastically with everybody who thinks. I think I agree it's about, I mean, any good relationship, right, has to be built, built on giving and, and getting on both sides, right? And there needs to be honesty and clarity and respect and trust, right? Because, I mean, at the end, for us, you know, if people don't trust us, if they don't like what we're doing, if they don't believe that we have their interests at heart, they will vote with their feet. Right? They won't come back. They won't recommend their friends. They won't participate in our research. So a lot of what we do is, is really, you know, working hard to to be clear, to be to help people understand, to be very upfront about what we're doing, and to always try to give some value back for everything that we ask for. Right. So if we ask you to participate in a study, we try to tell you what's involved, and then we also try to give you updates about what's going on. You know, how many people are participating? Have there been any findings? How can you apply those findings to you? Have any papers been published? Here's what the what the what they said. Right. I think if we want to continue to have a positive long-term relationship with our customers, we have to work really hard to be a good participant in that relationship. So there's also the, the broader regulatory systems that you all operate in. Um, you know, there's HIPAA, there are, you know, for Bernard's system to be able to do telemedicine across state lines, there's regulations related to that. Uh, Joyce you know, the, the FDA is kind of front and center in your equation. How can we bring, you know, some of the kind of fresh thinking and novel ideas that we've been talking about here, or maybe they're just um, practical ideas, to, you know, the sort of regulatory infrastructure? Are there steps that we collectively need to be taking? Um, wh what are the pressure points, and, and where do you see that going? Stephanie? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go, because... Um, having spent so much time in the government, it, take, it does take a long time to change policy. 
Um, it really does, sadly. There is also, though, a lot of creativity on the, uh, on, you know, in each of the agencies. And I think when you work with the agencies up front and uh, those who are the regulators, uh, there's there are solutions that are often very creative that you can find. So that's one thing. Um, but I'm really excited. You know, I'm sort of a policy wonk and have been for a number of years now. I'm excited about the opportunity to build this big research uh, resource, which is um, novel in its scale and uh, for the research uh, enterprise um, and be able to learn how we can do policy more effectively. You know, we have, we have, we're implementing an electronic consent, we have a single IRB, other things that other folks have tested, um, but it's not easy to pull together a single IRB with 60 institutions who are used to holding the liability themselves and really tightly. So we're learning a lot and, and you know, we're already directly feeding that back into uh, NIH, so the Office of Science Policy that's been developing the single IRB policy. I've already uh, given them all of the hurdles we've already faced so that they can, in, you know, building, as they're getting the rest of the country ready to be working under one IRB when there's a multi-site study, they can sort of address those right off the bat. So I, I think, you know, we, we probably have to get better. It's not so easy when you're not connected directly to the agencies that develop the policies, right, to give that feedback. And they don't often seem like they want it um, as a bureaucrat. Uh, but, uh, but I think there is there, there needs to probably be more of that loop, feedback loop. Joyce, thoughts on that in terms of the regulatory paradigm, what you guys have experienced? Sure. So, I mean, at least within our field, we're relatively well known for not understanding, at least initially, sort of how the regulatory framework works. I think we're very typically Silicon Valley from that perspective. Um, I think what was for us, though, I think we, you know, we understand that we, we always have a lot to learn and we always will. And so I think what really worked was just, I mean, again, just trying to be sort of you know, humble and saying like, help us understand, what, you know, what are we trying to achieve here? And really developing that relationship to say, okay, like we now understand, you know, with us and FDA, we have a goal. How are we gonna get there together, right? And what are your concerns and what are our limitations and, and how are we gonna get there? And I think what, you know, what we, one of the things that we learned is that like, look, you know, this is hard for them too, right? There's like a lot of guardrails that they have to negotiate and it is, it's, it's a difficult challenge that they've been tasked with. And so to the extent that we can, you know, sort of understand where they're coming from, propose solutions, work with them to sort of modify those solutions to get to a point where like, okay, this makes sense, right? They were really, I think, you know, they're really looking to, you know, the people who want to do these new things to say, what makes sense, you know, and and we'll work with you from our perspective and say, okay, let's modify this so that we can we can all get comfortable with it. And it's worked out I mean, ultimately, it's worked out great for us. Well, and it really is, I think, a Mars and Venus story. We were talking at lunch about how um, Silicon Valley, you know, you can conjure up your own image. <laughs> you sort of live and work there. You know, Ronnie, you grew up there. You went to high school with Ann Wojcicki. You know, Silicon Valley is not New Hampshire Avenue, Silver Spring, where the FDA is located. So it's th th nothing wrong with either place, right? But it, they're vastly different ecosystems and worlds and worldviews. I flew out here from D.C., two prominent members of Congress stuck way back in coach, um, you know, kind of in their little seats with their laptops. So it's it's not necessarily a glamorous life stuff, except when we bring you out here to the Global Conference, right? right? Yeah, but um, you free stress balls. Uh, you know, I, I think what you're bringing up <laughs> is that you, you really do have to kind of understand who you're interacting with. Yeah. Bernard, thoughts on that, Ronnie? Uh, definitely. Um, and, you know, our experience is that uh, many of the regulators are willing to listen and, um, you know, fact-based and willing to try to work with you. And we have taken that approach that we embrace our regulators, uh, not that we have a choice, you know, in some cases, but we have moved so far ahead on the use of technology and patient safety through technology that we have big issues inside of Kaiser Permanente. We have physicians, precious resources in our Permanente Medical Group doing certain things right now simply because we're regulatory required and it makes no sense what mm -hmm. we're doing. It's based on a paper-based system. It's based on something that was written 20, 30, 40 years ago. And we can demonstrate now the advancement of technology. If a patient is in a Kaiser Permanente hospital, they're hooked up 24 hours a day. So some of the sign-offs and stuff that you do under a traditional system is really just a misuse of our belief of a right. physician's time. Well, we can't argue about that. We have to continue to show the evidence and to drive that along. 
the issue about telemedicine, the ability of giving more access to someone through the e-visit is in fact a strength and a better connectivity to the patient. We have to help the regulators to understand what that means because they're dealing with different paradigms. You know, how much is going to cost versus in our structure, it's about additional access. And so there are valid issues on both sides and I have found sitting down working through it uh, to be the best way to try to approach it uh, in these days. Great. Eric, and Ronnie, anything? Steph? I was just going to ask a follow-up question. Do you feel like you have the forum to do that with regulators, to, to share your experience? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, you know, we obviously had a big change in administration um, from President Obama to yeah. President Trump. But My e face is uh, showing nothing right now. Yeah. <laughs> but, but even in that... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no reaction. Even in a fast I was going to say it bigly, and now yeah. I have to say it. <laughs> but but even as you know, even in that environment, um, we have a forum that we've been able to um, begin to raise some of the issues that we were talking through to try yeah. to move that along. So I would say um, yes, and um, that's been historic for us. So it's not like new, but we try to embrace that. Thoughts on this topic, Eric? I think, uh, you know, it's interesting four out of the five of us come from Silicon Valley on this panel. Um, and as, as kind of Fitbit stuff starts getting more and more into FDA or other regulatory environments, um, you know, speak to a lot of other Bay Area companies. And there's definitely this divide between, you know, the people who feel like, oh, you know, the regula regulators are bad. Let's just work around them. And invariably, then they complain about regulators who get in their way. And those which you know Fitbit subscribed to is like you know how do you actually work collaboratively with the regulators? And if you go and saying we're not necessarily the smartest kids on the block, you know the regulations are there for a reason. Let's you know as Bernard was saying like you know hey this made sense then yeah. this is another way of doing things. Let's talk. Um, I think one of the things that's truly amazing to me is how willing people are to talk and actually seek out change. Uh, most of the regulators actually are doing it to actually you know I'm glad that I'm, when I take a medication it's regulated. Um, you know, it's not something that's, you know, snake oil. And so, you know, regulation adds value. And the trick is just how do you make sure it makes sense in the 21st century right. with each of our new things, although we're all snowflakes, we're not completely unique snowflakes. And um, I think that's, uh, there's a lot of value there in just having a good dialogue. Well, and uh, Stephanie, being the lone representative of the, of the federal government, I mean, we, Faster Cures, uh, put something on our website that's the 21st Century Cures Act tracker. So it breaks down the various components of that legislation, which uh, was signed <coughs> last December. Uh, and th there's a lot of stuff in there. The reason we put the tracker up was because we felt like if we were kind of confused about when all the deadlines were, everybody else would be too, so we open sourced it and shared it. You know, you guys have the sort of double burden of making sure that you're hitting all the marks of did we do everything that Congress told us we had to do while trying to do what you're talking about, Eric and Bernard and Ronnie, which is kind of can you evolve your thinking? Um, those are not easy jobs. So I do think this, in a way, two-way conversation between these sectors and industries and the regulatory paradigm has to happen. I mean, right. there's just no other yeah. way for us to evolve. And, and I'm not a regulator, but I do think it's important to acknowledge um, this notion that they're, they're trying to do, they're trying to match the spirit of what we set them up for, right? What the agent, we set the agency up for or, or, or designed the legislation or a regulation around. Uh, you know, at FDA, they, they want to make sure that nobody, that everyone's safe and that when we take a drug, we understand where it came from and that a device tells us what we think it tells us. And, and when it changes your course of medical care, that it, you actually have accurate results that it's based off of. Yeah. So if you sort of go in understanding that that's where they're coming from, yeah. uh, I think that that like changes the posture of the whole conversation. Right. You know? And this administration already, um, Secretary Price, it, we've had a couple of meetings where we presented the transition team work that I talked about. Um, <laughs> There's several different groups that are part of a group, kind of a teach-in about NIH and biomedical research coming up in another week or so. Um, there's discussions on value coverage pricing. So I, I think that we are starting to see a lot of momentum and activity and discussion, um, you know, which I think is, is good. So we're gonna take maybe one or two questions from the audience if anyone has something. Uh, yes, in the back. I want someone to ask Margaret to dance. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> 
That's a late a night, night, you guys. Dancer, Come on. So I'm sorry, I can't, I can't ask <laughs> you ahead. to dance. Um, but for um, this is actually for maybe Mr. Um, Tyson in terms of Rick Kaiser. You know, one of the issues, take like type 1 diabetes where it's tons of data analysis. And, you know, with all this data coming in, unfortunately, doctors are only supposed to spend about 15 minutes per patient. And so with all this data and trying to consolidate this data, you know, there's sort of two currents here. And so, you know, kind of where does this go? The data is so helpful, obviously, to help, but at the same time, doctors don't necessarily have the time. And actually, if anything, it's been a deterrent for, you know, endocrinologists to get involved. And so, you know, I'd just be curious your thoughts and maybe for some of the others on how do you get maybe better data or more concise synopsis data to try to help uh, with patients? Yeah, uh, a, couple of, um, a couple of thoughts on that. The, the, the first one is um, related to something I referenced earlier. If you stop and think about the, um, the way the industry have defined the productivity of a doctor, it's been in minutes and how many patients are you seeing and all those things. And then you fast forward now to the 21st century where a physician is spending time in the office and time on the computer, time trying to make sense out of data, et cetera. So a couple of things that we're working on through the physicians in the Permanente Medical Group. One is to really rethink how do you define productivity for a physician. That's the first and foremost. So what does that mean in the 21st century? Our measurements in the industry, for example, around patient satisfaction is based on a physical visit. So even incorporating now the satisfaction that people have from e-visits and phone visits and video visits, we got to figure out in Kaiser Permanente and the industry how to aggregate that into there. The second piece is physicians cannot practice alone. And so who's the team that should be around the physician to do those kind of things? And then the third one is now with technology, how do we go from data to artificial intelligence? Not answering the question of artificial intelligence telling you what to do, but a better way to aggregate and understand the data into information that is useful to make better decisions. And I think that's the tracks that we are working on as we have evolved now to your point of all of this data and information, how do we distill it and make sense out of it? And defining it into a 15 minute visit, I think we're all learning is now running this course, but figuring out what the right answer is, I think is still work our physicians are doing uh, at Kaiser Permanente. Anyone else on that? So I, I think one of the really interesting trends is, so, you know, taking something outside of the world, you know, various cancer diagnostic things where it's like, hey, they can scan large numbers of images very quickly and say, hey, maybe you should look here, here, and here. Or, you know, various things around, you know, in, in Fitbit data world, uh, you know, here's your average heart rate or here's the average person's heart rate or, you know, and here are the anomalies. Go look here because that's probably where the trouble lies. That's how you make kind of the, you know, the real intelligence, the really expensive intelligence, which is doctors, more effective and more efficient. But I do think that you're raising, uh, the question raised, I think, an interesting point around the mass of data and the mass of data that a patient with type 1 has, you know, on a daily, on an hourly basis. I mean, there's, you know, Fitbit data, there's, you know, we are going to have to, I think, work hard as a system to try to understand how do we take all of this information and make it relevant and useful. Um, we had one, you have another thought on that? And then Annette, if we add, have a second. Just to underscore one of, one of the points um, uh, Bernard made in his response is that while of course we need to get smarter and nerdier about data synthesis and um, telling more with, with fewer seconds required, fewer images, what, what have you, um, we are, we are um, inevitably heading towards more team-based management. Um, physicians aren't that important says uh, one of the not so important physicians. Um, uh, it's re this, this is a really, really hard job. It's getting harder, not just because of the data, but because everything is changing more quickly. And so um, I think one of the most important advances is going to be um, how um, efficiently and intelligently and thoughtfully we can evolve to take care of patients as teams and not as, not as individuals. Do we have time for another question? OK. Uh, Annette, you had your hand up. Talking about health citizenship, yeah. one of the things that we've been struggling with at the foundation is what is the information that you give back to the patient so that they get relevant information back and that they're not just overwhelmed with yeah. five terabyte of data? 
Steph, I want you to start on that. Sure. I mean, we, we haven't we haven't tried this yet. We haven't started yet. But our intention is to work really closely with our participants to figure out what it is they want to get back. Um, I, and Joyce will have some insight, certainly, into how people um, digest what they give back. But um, we will start small with you know survey I information. Ultimately, we'll run genomics on samples, and we will start to give back actionable genetic results. Um, it's a promise that we've made, and we intend to keep it. Um, but over time, we will have even more and more types of data. Uh, we're going to have to learn from the participants themselves what's been valuable and what's not. Um, we do have a pledge. We, we are sort of giving back information proactively in a, to a smaller degree, what we think is actually useful uh, and making sure we have the resources to support that without going broke. Um, but we also want to make sure that people know they can get all of their data back if they ask. So as we imagine, there will be a very small portion of people who will want all of their data. I mean, there's there are anecdotes out there of people who've gotten their full genome and actually like you know attempted to cure their child's disease with that. And we want to make that available, so we will. Uh, but that will be upon request only. Joyce. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of things. Like, people often ask us, you know, when are you going to go whole genome? Because right now we do a genotyping chip, which is just a small fraction of the genome. And I think the thing is, like, r as of today, it's not just a cost issue, but a lot of the inf information in there is not useful, right? It doesn't actually tell us anything today. They, that might be different 5, 10, 20 years from now. But today, it doesn't tell you that much. And so, you know, I think one of, one of our jobs is to say, what we have to, at this point, sort of try to curate the information and say what's actually useful to you. And we have to put a lot of effort into saying what are the key concepts that you need to understand in order to be able to use this information and do we, can we couch it in a way that you can understand. And I mean, in the work that we've done, we can show that you know, more than 90% of people across all educational strata can understand. I think the other part of it, though, as, as Stephanie pointed out, we do make the data available to people, right? So, you know, there are some people that are going to be savvy users and they're going to take it and use it their own way. But I think, you know, at the top level for most people, there is, there's, there's some pieces of information that are the most valuable. It isn't going to be all of the data. So it looks like our panel time has run out, but I hope that we have piqued your interest in these topics. Uh, and kind of inspired you to either get involved from a you know financial investment standpoint in in this new world that w we've been talking about, or maybe it's kind of challenged you as a as an individual to think about how you can get more engaged in some of these types of enterprises. Um, we're pretty excited about this at Faster Cures. We've kind of witnessed some of the transformation, and I think we have. Uh, achieved a lot, but there's a lot more to do. So I want to thank our terrific panelists and thank all of you.